Okay, and you have to accept that. Got it. Okay. And then um, I want to point out a couple of things on e learning um, that we're going to be using this evening. Um, you can see there is a PDF here called Other Comprehensive Income Example One. There's really only one example for other comprehensive income. And then we'll have a cumulative effect, which is an Excel file uh, that I'll be going through a little bit later. So um, I'm thinking that'll happen after the break, I guess. So you may want to go ahead and at some point download those so you have them available on your screen as I'm going through them uh, here together with the class. And uh, you can see the recording for uh, le lecture one that we had last time. And then um, for this evening's lecture, I will also post it here. And there's a Zoom link that takes you out to uh, the YouTube page where I post those up. Okay. All right, good. So with all that, let's see if we can find where we left off. And you should be seeing on your screen right now um, where, by my recollection, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, we had left off left last time with uh, module four, which was um, a second part of the revenue recognition discussion. There's really no distinction other than Becker tries to break up the material into bite-sized modules. So they couldn't fit everything about revenue recognition in um, you know, an appropriately sized, bite-sized, whatever you want to call that module. So they just put it into a uh, second module and called it part two. But we're continuing the discussion of revenue recognition. And what we're going to first talk about here are incremental costs of obtaining a contract, okay? And basically, guys, the rule is pretty straightforward, pretty simple, and I'm gonna have you flashcard here, which is if the cost would have been incurred regardless as to whether we secured the contract, then it should be expensed. If a cost is incurred after we have already secured the revenue contract, then that cost should be capitalized as an asset, as long, of course, as it has future economic benefit to the entity, and then it should be expensed over the term of that contract. So you take a look and they tell us the incremental cost of obtaining a contract or cost incurred that would have not been incurred if the contract had not been obtained. Those costs would be recognized as an asset, they're capitalized, and they are to be uh, amortized, of course, if they have future economic benefit. In other words, the entity expects to, through some way, recover the cost of that by having the use of whatever was acquired by the um, costs that were incurred to recognize, to obtain that contract. And the, uh, an entity will recognize an expense if the cost would not have been incurred regardless of whether the uh, would have, I should say, would have been incurred regardless of whether uh, the contract had been obtained. Okay, so let's just look at this example, and I want you to go ahead and flashcard uh, that rule there, those rules, go ahead and flashcard those, but let's just take a look at this example, and we have a software developer enters into a contract with a customer to transfer a software license, perform installation, provide software updates, and tech support for three years in exchange for 240000 now, that's really not uh, relevant to what we're trying to learn here, but then you can take a look and they say, in order to win the contract, the developer incurred the following costs, legal fees to draw up the contract, travel costs to deliver the proposal, and commission paid to the sales employee that is basically selling this uh, contract to this customer. Now, when you take a look at this, what? You're not going to pay the legal fees to draw up the contract unless you what actually have the contract. So that cost can be capitalized. Travel cost to deliver the proposal. Well, look, even if the person said, sorry, I don't like that deal. I'm not going to go into contract with you. Those costs would have been incurred. So those should be expensed. Commission, of course, is only paid to the employee if they actually have the sale. So the 10,000 and the 20 and the 12,000 here would be costs that would be capitalized and then amortized. And in this case, since it's a three year contract, it would be amortized over the um, three year period here. 
the travel costs would be what? Would be expensed because they would have been incurred even if the developer uh, did not get the contract. And as I've said, the legal fees and the um, the legal fees and the um, cost to drop the contract, the legal fees and the sales commission. I guess they want me to do something else there that I don't want to do. So let me just use this one, turn this yellow. The legal fees and the sales commission would be recognized an asset and then, as I said, be amortized. Question. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now, cost to fulfill a contract and a cost to fulfill a contract means that I have the contract, but now I need to have some equipment or something to actually fulfill the contract. So what are the rules there? Should I capitalize that? And they tell us that cost to fulfill a contract that are not covered in the scope of a similar standard. So what happens? Accounting standards say that if something has future economic benefit, it should be capitalized, right? So we don't really need to look to these rules for that. But if it's something that wouldn't fall under another accounting standard, we would look to these rules and we must meet all of these criteria in order to capitalize that. So in order to capitalize a cost to fulfill a contract, it would have to relate directly to the contract they would have to generate or enhance the resources of the entity. And again, when we say they're expected to be recovered, we don't mean that someone's gonna pay us back necessarily for that asset. We mean that we are going to reap the future economic benefit of whatever we have spent that on. Now notice they give us some specifics here of cost to be expensed, include general selling and administrative costs, which are always expense wasted labor and materials cost wasted is the key word there if we wasted something that would be uh, considered an abnormal spoilage that would be expense and cost tied to satisfy performance obligation in other words match against the revenue you would have already taken for having satisfied that performance obligation than any cost that um, you have expensed to fulfill that contract uh, that you have incurred to fulfill that contract would be expense. So you can also flashcard those specifics down there. Question. Okay, good. If there's no question on that, then let's go ahead and take a look at our next section. And guys, I'm not going to go through this example because it's just sort of the um, material was pretty self-explanatory there. So I don't see that we should spend our valuable time here looking at example when there's something that we um, already understand. Now, principal versus an agent. And it becomes important because it's going to affect how we will um, recognize our revenue. So we need to determine, are we the principal or are we the agent? Okay, so let's just talk through a couple of uh, examples, okay, before we get into the details of the material here. Let's say I'm Nordstrom and I'm going to sell you a shirt, okay? Now, as the seller of that shirt, the shirt is made by XYZ shirts, whatever, right? As Nordstrom, am I the principal or am I the agent? And in that situation, Nordstrom would likely be what? Likely be the principal, okay? And they would likely be the principal because they um control the good or service right when you walk into nordstrom they control the good or service before it's transferred to the customer and when that's the case the revenue recognition is equal to the gross consideration the entity expected to receive now guys i'm going to use small numbers i doubt that nordstrom has a shirt that they sell you for 10 bucks but i don't want to get into you know pricing of shirts here so i'm just going to go ahead and say the shirt costs ten dollars and let's say the cost of that shirt is $8, okay? So we would have what? We'd have sales, probably should have wrote sales first. We'd have cost of goods sold, right, of $8. And so what would happen? Nordstrom would recognize a gross profit there of $2 on their income statement because they'd say sales minus cost of goods sold. And that's the case because what? because Nordstrom really controlled that inventory prior to you walking in and, uh, and uh, purchasing that shirt, whatever it was, okay? Now, 
you take a look at an agent and they say the entity arranges for another party to provide the good or service to the customer. When this is the case, the revenue is equal to the fee or commission for, for, for performing the agent function. Okay, well, now we're talking about, and I think you all can uh, relate to this these days, we're talking about Uber, aren't we? What happens? You use the Uber app, and what happens? Uber dispatches a private courier that's going to come and pick you up from your adventure out at the nightclub or whatever it is the reason that you're uh, ordering the uber so what happens the cab driver is going to charge you the ten dollars let's say for the ride but two dollars of that is going to be what a fee that uber charges uh the driver uh, as part of their role as the agent. So if that's the case, now Uber would recognize what? Would recognize sales of $2. They would have cost of goods sold of what? Zero, just looking specifically at this very um, you know, transaction. And then the gross profit would be what? Would be $2. Now, let me ask you, who would you rather be, Nordstrom or uber probably uber because what you have a gross profit percentage of what of 100 percent, which looks pretty good to analysts okay whereas nordstrom would be sitting there at um you know uh 100 now when you look at this though they give us some guidance that we should flash card <clears throat> that will help us determine excuse me whether we are the principal or whether we are the agent and probably more specifically this is uh, some yeah. sorry this, this is some guidance that's going to tell me whether or not i am the agent okay and i am the agent if another party flashcard this is primarily responsible for fulfilling the contract in other words you know, it's not Uber's CEO doesn't come and pick you up and say, here I am with an Uber hat on. It's what, it's whoever you happen to, you know, get as the person that's uh, going to use their privately owned vehicle to come pick you up. The entity does not have inventory risk. Well, okay, there's probably no inventory at all here. But notice in the case of Nordstrom, they did have the inventory risk, right? And then the entity does not have discretion in establishing prices. Now, it doesn't have to be all these criteria in my understanding. And if you look at Uber's terms of service, it's a little hazy as to how the prices are set. And I've looked at that a couple of times and I still can't figure out how Uber sets their uh, the price. Okay, so they do set the price, but they're still bound by things that are out of their control. For example, there are certain city ordinances that say, hey, you can only charge this much to go this far during certain times of the evening and whatnot that I'm sure Uber, like any cab driver, would be bound to uh, to a certain extent. So they don't have complete autonomy into the price setting in their case either i don't think it's again a little hard when you look at their prints their uh, terms but um the to tell exactly how they're setting the prices but uh nonetheless you don't have to meet all these criteria right these are just general guidelines to determine whether or not you're the agent versus the principal okay okay good why don't you go ahead and flash card this notion that if you're the principal how you would um, recognize the revenue, okay? And then if you're the agent, how you recognize the revenue. But I think you'll remember that example, help you answer any questions there. Okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead then, and again, I'm not gonna look at their example because guys, I like mine better, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's look at repurchase agreements, okay? And this is probably as wonky as we're gonna get tonight uh, with some of this revenue recognition stuff. And this is a little wonky repurchase agreements, okay? And so repurchase agreements fall into two broad categories, okay? They are either going to be considered a forward in which the entity um, must repurchase, or they're going to fall into an option in which the entity may have to be uh, required to repurchase something. And if it is at uh, the discretion of the seller to repurchase or not, we call that a call. 
if it is at the discretion of the purchaser to make us rebuy it, uh, that is called a put. So we either have a forward or an option. We deal with option. It's either a call option where I may go ahead and exercise my right as the seller to repurchase or a put option in which the buyer will tell me that I have to uh, repurchase this at their discretion. Okay. Now, um, when you look at these, how we account for these will depend on the uh, repurchase price to a large extent. Okay. So let's just take a look. And um, as I've said, a repurchase agreement is a contract in which an entity sells an asset and also promises or has the option to repurchase the asset. The three main forms of repurchase agreements include the entity's obligation, which is a forward. And then we really get into options. Both of these are options. So I guess they're counting as a separate category. I counted them as one, which are options, which means we may or may not have to or be compelled to repurchase it. If the entity has the right to purchase, it's called a call option. If the entity has an obligation to repurchase at the customer's request, it is called a put option. So I'm looking at it a little differently. They're calling it three situations. I'm calling it two. A forward, I must repurchase it. An option, I have the option of repurchasing. I may repurchase it. And options fall into two categories, call or put. Okay. Now, if it is a forward or a call option, meaning that what in this situation, someone can either force me to repurchase it or I can make the decision to repurchase it, right? Forward or call option, the entities accounted for the contract will be based on whether it must or can, which is the call, repurchase the asset. And if it is for less than the original sales price, it's considered a lease. Now let's think about this. I sell you something for 50,000 and there's what an option here where I can buy it back from you for 40,000. Well, it's sort of like what? You lease the thing for me for a while, right? Okay, so we'll treat it as a lease and we'll talk about how to account for leases in chapter five. If it is equal or more to the original price, it will be a financing agreement. So think about this. I sell you something for $100,000 and you have the right to make me repurchase it for $120,000. Well, in effect, I've borrowed money from you. If I have to give you more money back than you gave me and you got to use the asset, in effect, I did what? I borrowed money from you, so it's treated as a financing agreement. So if the contract is, just looking here, a financing arrangement, the entity will recognize the asset as a financial liability for any consideration received from the customer and recognize interest expense for the difference between the amount of consideration received from the customer and the amount of consideration to be paid by the customer, okay? So flashcard, whether it is a financing agreement or a lease, more or less for the call or forward, and flashcard how that is treated. And let's just go over, and I do wanna look at this example because I think this really helps, okay? So let's just look at this example. In October 1st, Anderson Company enters into a contract with Tanner, for the sale of an excavator for 350,000. The contract includes a call option. This means that the buyer has the option, Anderson, the right to repurchase the excavator for what? For more than the original sales price. Well, look, if you're gonna repurchase something for more than the original sales price, it's like borrowing money from somebody, isn't it? I'm getting some money from you now, but I may give you all of your money and more back. Well, that's a lot like borrowing. Isn't that what happens when you borrow money? When you borrow money, you give the money back to the person, okay, at the end, and you probably give them more back, and that more back is what? It's considered interest, isn't it? Okay, so let's just take a look at that when... They, um, you know, sell the thing, they debit the cash, they credit the financial liability, then they will go ahead and since this only went over one year, they take that entire difference, okay, if it was over, say, two years, then you'd have to use present value calculations to do this, but they didn't want to get into all that, 
And so they just made it a one year deal. So at the end of the first year, there's interest expense here of 35,000 and that increases the financial liability. And then if they what, if they let that option lapse without exercising it, then they will go ahead and debit the financial liability and we are able to take the revenue now for that entire 385,000. So when you think about it, it becomes the, the impact on that income is zero for that interest expense. It becomes a what? A presentation and disclosure issue and that we present it as what? An interest expense, but we increase the revenue by the amount of that interest. So it washes on our net income. Now, of course, if the uh, option was exercised, then what? Then instead of crediting revenue, they would what? You can write in there, if exercise, if they exercise the option, we of course would credit cash. Okay, question on that? Okay, like I said, this gets a little wonky, guys. You know, I don't think the examiners are going to, you know, sit here and hammer you with this kind of stuff because it starts to get a bit granular, doesn't it? Repurchase agreement, is it a forward? Is it a option? If it is a call option, is the repurchase price less or more than the original price? I mean, that starts to get to me kind of even beyond the scope really where the examiners would want to go with something like this. But again, um, we've got some key flashcards and an example here that help us take away, um, you know, what I think some of the key thoughts are here. Okay. Now, if we're talking about a put option, okay, now what? Now the buyer has the right to force me to repurchase it if they want to. Okay. So if the entity has an obligation to repurchase the asset at the customer's request, for less the original price, the entity will account for the contract as either a lease, which is the same deal that we saw for the call option, or a sale with the right to return if the customer does not have a significant uh, economic incentive to uh, exercise the right. In other words, I think they're thinking that the fair value of the equipment at that point in time would be more than whatever the option price was. So why would they let us buy it back for less? Then um, we would account for it as a sale, but we'd have to recognize the right to return, meaning that we would have to have an estimate of how much we think they would actually exercise those options and we would take a contra sales account for uh, our estimated amount of returns. And we're gonna look at that here in a couple of minutes in more generic case, not in a uh, put option type of a situation. If the purchase price is equal to or greater than the original price, again, if that's the case, then uh, it will be a financing agreement. And it's if the repurchase price is more, than the expected market value. Well, now we're thinking what? Yeah, they're probably gonna do this, right? They've got this thing that has a market value of 100,000 and they can make us repurchase it for 150,000. They're probably gonna exercise that right. I'm gonna give them more than their money back. That's a financing agreement. And then a sale with the right return if the repurchase price is less than or equal to the expected market value of the, as of the asset. And again, I assume the customer does not have a significant, whatever that would be, economic incentive um, to uh, exercise the right, okay? So you take a look at these guys, you can go ahead and flashcard these rules if you don't have some things in the flashcards already that uh, kind of get to the essence of this. My sense is this gets a little bit granular, even for the CPA exam. Okay, I don't think they're going to waste off a bunch of questions for you. you might get one or two things that ask you this um, to get into all these kind of, you know, wonky sort of rules. Okay, okay, good. Uh, let's look at bill and hold arrangements. So what happens here? I buy something from you, but I'm not ready to receive the um, item yet. I'm building my factory. I bought up a piece of equipment from you, but you know, my factory isn't done yet. 
and you're ready to deliver the equipment to me and you say, John, I say, uh, Serena, is it okay if um, you hang on to this for me for a couple of months until my factory's done, we're behind schedule on the uh, production of that. You say, sure, we'll do this for you. Yeah, I'll hold it for you. We've got space here. We'll hold it for you. We'll set it aside. We're not going to sell it to anybody else. We'll hold it for you. Under that situation, Serena would be able to do what? Recognize that revenue because they are simply holding that item for me what as an accommodation. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. So for a customer to have obtain control of a product in a bill and hold arrangements, all the following criteria must be met. And we're looking at the accounting for the sale here, um, for the seller here. There must be a substantive reason for the arrangement. I've, cut, I've requested it because I don't have space or my little example, I don't even have the factory yet. The product has been separately identified as belonging to the customer. The product is currently ready for transfer and the entity cannot use the product or direct it to another customer. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and uh, I think it's worthwhile. Um, well, we don't have to go there yet, but just when you're reviewing this stuff later, when you're making up this flashcard, uh, we're going to get an example of this actually in our first class question this evening, question one, which is on page 38. And so uh, when you're making up that flashcard, it may not be a bad idea to look at that question to reinforce, reinforce a numeric example, although it be in the form of a multiple choice question. We'll look at that here, I think, in a couple of minutes. I don't want to go there. Uh, well, why not? Let's go there now. Don't hurt us, right? So let's just jump over a couple, three pages to just reinforce that right now. Okay, and we'll come back to this other stuff, but uh, I think maybe it's probably a better, better teaching technique to go ahead and just ask you this one right now. Okay, so uh, let's put up the poll for our first question, assuming my cursor hasn't gone south on me somewhere. Okay, there it is. Okay, good, we can take that first poll today. Okay, guys, I'm looking at this and I've got one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four times three is 12, 13, 14. I've got 15 students in the class. I have to uh, subtract one for my 
two for myself. That's 1312. So there's one student not choosing for some reason. Okay. All right. Now, um, when I take a look at this, I've got two students not choosing for some reason. So guys, what will start to happen, um, I'll start to call out names if everyone doesn't participate. And then I'm going to be looking at your homework. And I've already started to take a look at the homework. And there are a couple of you that, um, you know, um, haven't done anything. Okay. And that's not going to work. This class is all about participating in the lectures as we go along, attempting the questions as we go along, and then doing the homework, preparing to sit for and pass the CPA exam. That's what this class is about, okay? So uh, if you're thinking, hey, I don't wanna do that, this would be, you know, the time is still right to uh, make a different decision about taking the class, okay? But my expectation is that everyone will participate in these questions. And if I don't see that, I'm going to start to call, you know, call folks out and see what uh, everyone has to say about a particular question. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. We got a 73% on this. I like us to be around 75 on any question, but one that is fairly straightforward like this one, I would hope, hope that, um, you know, we would have gotten, you know, more like around um, 90%, but, and, and I don't think that it should have taken us two minutes. A question like this, should, although right now I'm not pushing you about time, but on the exam, certainly a question like this should not take you a full two minutes, it should take you maybe, maybe 20 seconds, because there's a lot to read here, but not much more than that, okay, and the idea is, what are the criteria to account for this as a bill and hold that would allow us to take the revenue at the time that we are uh, sitting here and being able to deliver this thing, which in this case was September 1st. So you take a look at this and they tell us that this Jojo Roasters sells coffee bean roasters. Jojo entered into agreement with Smooth and Bold to manufacture five roasters, um, ro not roadsters, but roasters um, um, to their production facility. The roasters were manufactured to their specification and completed on September 1st, year one, uh, excuse me, year two. Due to delays in the construction of the new facility, they agreed to maintain in a separate section until the facility was open in year three. SMB paid for the roasters on October 1st. Now on October 1st, they'd be a receivable and on October 1st, that receivable would be liquidated. So the payment is not what constitutes recognition of revenue. We're on accrual accounting, right? What recognizes the revenue is that we satisfied the agreement, which is that what? We had the roasters ready to go on September 1st, and then we just held them as an accommodation. Now, some of you picked January 10th, which I can't understand that because that's not cash accounting. Um, if you said October 1st, um, or some of you said October 1st, which were not on cash accounting, so there'd be no reason to choose October 1st. Some of you maybe picked January 10th because you were looking and you were maybe thinking that we had to meet all of the criteria that we mentioned on the earlier pages. And what they, you, you can't assume a criteria that, that isn't there. So there's nowhere where it says that we could have directed it to another customer or not. So you don't, you know, assume that if it doesn't say that in the question. So you can't look for every single criteria. You have to look, do they call out one of the criteria that would nullify? If it said that JoJo could direct it to another customer, then it wouldn't be a revenue until, you know, we were actually um, receiving payment or something like that. But that's not the case here. Um, you know, they didn't say that, so you can't assume that, okay? Question? Okay, so I think that's a pretty straightforward question, guys. So I would kind of expect that we would have gotten 100% on that, but uh, that's okay, okay? Let's look at consignment now, coming back, because I just wanted to go to that question, but let's come back now to consignment. So what happens here? I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say after you pass the CPA exam, you work hard, you get your license, you become a CPA, and you decide to write a book, and the book is going to be titled Mothers 
don't let your children grow up to be CPAs. Okay, you decide to write that book. Now, what happens? You go to Barnes and Noble and they say, no, thank you. We're not interested in buying that book for our inventory. And you're like, darn. And so they take pity on you and they say, I'll tell you what. You can go ahead and put a cardboard cutout of yourself over here in the corner of the store. You can pile your books up here. If somebody buys them, then we'll go ahead and give you that uh, sales price minus a 1% commission. And you say, okay, thank you for doing that for me, right? Now, what happens? Those goods are out on consignment. And in that situation, you would be the cosigner and Barnes and Noble would be the cosignee. Now we'll talk about inventory later, but just in chapter four, or is it three? I can't remember, I think it's chapter, I can't, I think it's chapter three. In chapter three, we'll talk about the inventory aspect of this, which is at the end of the year, that would be included in your ending inventory, not Barnes and Noble. And for our sale discussion, that is not a sale until what? until the third party comes in and decides to buy your book. You can't recognize that sale because you've simply done what? You've simply left those books at Barnes and Noble and you're hoping that somebody uh, buys them at that point in time, okay? So consignment, when the dealer or distributor has not obtained control of the product, revenue is recognized when the dealer or distributor sells the product to a customer or when the dealer or distributor obtains control of the uh, product, okay, or in other words, after a specific, specific period of time has elapsed, okay, so uh, Barnes and Noble would not be recognizing uh, any sale on that, you would recognize the sale when a third party uh, purchases that, okay, okay, good, let's come over and let's look at warranties, okay, and basically what we need to determine is when we uh, sell a warranty or we sell a product with a warranty, is the warranty a separate performance obligation? Okay, now I think you've all had the experience, at least I have, you know, Best Buy, they know me by name, okay, because I always got to go in there and buy some piece of equipment. And, you know, I'm the guy that leaves mice and clickers, you know, all over America as I go to different campuses and teach different classes. I'm always leaving some peripheral behind and I got to walk in there and I got to, you know, buy something that I left behind at one of the campuses, right? So what happens? They start to know you by name and when they see me, they always say, oh, hey, you know, did you want the extended warranty with this? And of course, I always say no, okay? Now, when they offer you an extended warranty, that extended warranty is often above and beyond what the manufacturer gives. And I never like to get it because I always think it's some sort of ripoff, right? Okay. So if it is a warranty that extends beyond the manufacturer's warranty, okay, then that tends to be what? A separate performance obligation, a separate sale. If the warranty comes along with the product, then you will simply what? simply treat it as a single performance obligation. And you may have to allocate the price between what? Between the sale for the item and the portion that is rele uh, relevant to the warranty, okay? So let's just take a look. The accounting for the warranty will depend on whether a customer has the option to purchase the warranty separately, okay? And that really is what it's all about there, but let's just keep reading. If it can, be purchased separately. The warranty will be considered a distinct service because it is promised to the customer in addition to the uh, uh, product covered by the contract. An entity will therefore account for the warranty as a performance obligation allocate allocated portion of the overall transaction price. If the warranty cannot be purchased separately, then there is no separate performance obligation. Now, what we want a flashcard here is the following factors would be considered when determining whether the warranty represents a service in addition to the assurance that it, the product uh, is compliant with agreed upon specifications. So let's flashcard this because, you know, the examiners are going to make it so easy to say, well, it's sold separately. And, um, you know, they're more likely to test you on these criteria here that we're going to flashcard. So if the law requires the warranty, this would indicate that it is not a separate performance obligation. 
The longer the coverage period, the higher the likelihood that it is a separate performance obligation. If the entity must perform specific tasks to provide assurance regarding product compliance within a government upon specifications, these tasks are likely not a separate performance obligation. In other words, they say this is warranted for one year and something has to happen within that, you know, there has to be a repair within that one year, um, then that would not be considered a performance, separate performance obligation. Okay. Now you can come over here and look at a separate flashcard. If a warranty provides service to a customer that is beyond the assurance the product will comply with the agreed upon specifications, the promised service represents a performance obligation that will require transaction price be allocated to both the product and the service itself. And sometimes, you know, uh, they'll say, hey, you know, you can get an extra three years on this. I've had uh, warranties that have been offered where they'll say they'll give you a damage warranty. Hey, you know, here's the thing. And if you drop it, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll replace it. So you can actually get some sort of accidental insurance on that as well, warranty on that as well. Um, that would be uh, considered a separate performance obligation. It would have to be um, allocating the price to that. Okay. We'll talk about the specific accounting or warranties uh, in chapter five when we start talking about liabilities. Okay. Now, refund liabilities and right to return. Okay. And an entity should recognize a refund liability if it receives or will receive consideration for a customer and anticipates having to refund a portion or all of that consideration. Okay. Um, the refund liability represents the amount that it does not expect to be entitled to receive. Okay. So, what this is, guys, is an accounting estimate. You will be required, and we'll talk about more in this in um, when we talk about inventory in chapter three, but you would be required to estimate what you think the returns are going to be for your sales. You have to estimate that. How do you estimate that? You look at past experience. Hey, on average, you know, 5% of our sales get returned. 1% of our sales get returned. And you have to come up with an estimate and you have to book that as a return and a liability for the return at the time that you make the sale, okay? And um, an asset related to subsequent recovery of product when the refund liability is actually settled. In other words, um, you know, if the time expires and you think that you're not going to have to uh, provide that return, then that would be an asset. Now, that is not shown here. What they are showing us, and they kind of shortcut it a little bit here, guys, I'm going to do what I think would be more the full journal entry. We have this item that is 50,000, 10% of the items were purchased. Uh, and tend to be that are purchased tend to be returned. And that's our estimate. That's our, they say 10, right? So that isn't going to indicate to us that this is an estimate. Now, at the time of sale, we would debit the cash, just the way they showed us here. And really, you would credit the sales gross, 50,000. Okay. Then, you would go ahead and make a second entry here, which would be to debit the estimated sales returns of, um, what did they say, 5,000? And credit the refund liability for 5,000. This to me is more the way this would be done. Then, yeah, when the stuff gets brought back, 3,000 so far as it could be brought back, then you would go ahead and you would do what? You would debit the refund liability and credit the cash for that money that you're returning for whatever the returns are. Now, what is the impact on the income statement? On the income statement, we would show sales and we would have sales, what? Of 50,000 
and then we have what? And we pick up what the estimated returns are. Sales returns are 5,000. Now you're sitting there saying, yeah, John, but so far only 3,000 has been returned. Well, there's 2,000 that we don't know when it's going to be returned. It's going to be returned at what? At perhaps next year, but we want to match that estimate of the return against the sales that are generating this potential return. It becomes a matching concept at that point. And so the net sales, okay, that the entity then would report. And sometimes, yeah, I know companies start with net sales on their income statement, but um, for their you know, accounting purposes internally, they probably are keeping track of what, what this estimated sales uh, return is amount because they want to track how often their stuff actually gets returned. Uh, you would report it that way. Now, what happens is, you know, because so, sometimes students say, well, what happens if those other 2000 never get returned? Well, what that's going to do is going forward, we call that change in accounting estimate. And going forward, what will happen? Oh, going forward, if we don't have quite as many returns, then that 10% will do what? It'll come down over time, won't it? And so less and less will go into that um, you know, liability for the sales return. If we're lucky, maybe eventually we whittle that thing down to zero because we're not having any returns and we may not have uh, returns, although the reality is that you generally do. That's why FASB makes us make that estimate. Question? Okay, good. They come over and um, let's look at long-term uh, construction contracts, okay? Because we already looked at that question. So let's look at long-term construction contracts. So what's happening here? Remember we said that as um, we're performing under an obligation, we could recognize that over time. Remember we said that? And we said that when you recognize it over time, the way to estimate how much revenue you have recognized is either through output, which is commonly the case for what? For a service agreement, as we make the visits, we recognize the revenue, okay? Or inputs. Okay, well, the percentage of the completion method is really an input method that as you build an item, you're inputting all these resources into the creation of the asset, and they're let, going to let you recognize some of the revenue under the percentage of completion method. Now, in order to do this, you're going to need reliable engineering estimates that will allow you to determine how far along you are on the contract. If you have what? Built 20% of the building, they'll let you take 20% of the revenue. If you have right, taken, if you have built 40% of the building, they'll let you take 40%, right? Now, what happens if we don't have a reliable engineering estimate as to how far along we are? Well, if we don't have a reliable estimate, FASB says, well, if that's the case, use the completed contract method. In other words, don't take any profit on this thing until you're done since you don't have reliable estimate as to uh, how far along you are at any point in time. So we're going to study both methods, percentage of completion and completed contract. What we're going to see is we will be able to take profits as we build under percentage of completion. Under completed contract, no profits until you're done because you don't have a reliable estimate. However, under both methods, as soon as you realize you have a loss on a contract, you take that loss in its entirety immediately. Rule of conservatism trumps everything, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's take a look. Long-term construction contract, guys. This is something that was covered, and I wanna say it was covered under accounting research bulletin number 43. Okay, so what does that mean? It was something that was promulgated by the Committee on Accounting Procedure, the first standard setter that started in 1939. Yet the standard is still what? Still relevant all this time later because the Accounting Principles Board nor the FASB have seen any reason to overturn this. So this stuff was tested on my exam. Okay, that's now you know it's really old. It's been around 
for a long, long time. So the examiners might ask you two, three multiple choice questions on this, but this has been around so long that it's kind of old hat now. They're not as nearly as enthusiastic as asking about it as they were a long time ago, okay? But let's just go ahead and let's just take a look at percentage of completion method, okay? And let's just take a look and revenue is going to be recognized what? over time, okay, percentage of completion, and we're going to use the input method. So when a long-term construction contract meets criteria for the recognition of revenue over time, okay, meaning we have a reliable estimate, it is appropriate to use the percentage of completion method if the entity can do a reasonably estimate probability and provide reliable measure of progress towards completion. If they don't meet that criteria, get over there and use the completed contract method. That's the rule under US GAAP. Um, as you know, IFRS is no longer tested on the exam. IFRS does not allow the completed contract method, but US GAAP says, well, we want reliable information in our financial reports. And so we're not all about trying to increase revenue and have a higher profits, which is sort of the thing that IFRS always boasts. Well, their companies have higher profits under IFRS. So come hither and use IFRS. US GAAP says, eh, we're a little bit more interested in the conservative picture than higher uh, net income numbers. Okay, So they say, if you don't have reliable estimates, complete a contract. Okay, Now, come over. And how will we determine the revenue, the profit that should be recognized? And we are basically going to consider the cost that we've incurred to date as the numerator. The denominator will be what? The total estimated cost of the contract. So the total estimated cost of the contract is a million. And we have what? Spent 500,000 already. We are what? 50% done. It's that simple. If the total estimated cost of the contractor a million and we've spent what? 600,000 in developing this asset, then we have what? We have a 60% of the profit can be recognized, okay? Now, um, notice here that again, we have to have what? We have to have some other measure as progress towards completion. And the cost that you're putting in is probably a pretty good use of you know the resources that are being put in under this input method okay now most of the questions tend to focus on the income statement but there is a little bit here about balance sheet presentation okay and let's just go ahead and take a look as to what will constitute reporting a current asset in what will constitute reporting a current liability now under both cases, you will have the due on accounts receivable. So with the due on accounts receivable, okay, and let's just use an example. Say our costs, okay, this is for the current asset, our costs say equal a million dollars. But our billings, what we've actually billed, are only 900,000, okay? If that's the case, then what'll happen? We will report a current asset of accounts receivable of what, of 900,000. And we will report this current asset cost on estimated earnings in excess of progressive billing, sometimes called construction work in progress, okay? So I'm gonna use KIP, construction in progress, of what? Of 100,000, because we have billings in excess of what? In X, I mean, excuse me, we have costs, we have costs in excess of our billings of 100,000, okay? Now, we would have a current liability if our billings are in excess of our costs, okay? So we're gonna have to change the fact pattern up here a little bit. So let's just go ahead and say, now let's say our costs, and say our costs are a million. Say our costs are a million, but our billings, 
are 1,200,000. Now, as I said, and if we were to look at the balance sheet now, we'd still have the accounts receivable. So the current asset account receivable shows up in either case, which in this case now would be what? 1,200,000. But then we would show this what? This account billings in excess of cost. And the billings in excess of cost here are going to be uh, 200,000. And that, of course, is going to be a liability, right? That's that current liability. Okay. Now, again, the examiners don't get off much into the balance sheet presentation, but I think it's worthwhile for you to just understand that. You have what? You always have whatever you build as account receivable, but you could have what? A current asset if your costs are in excess of your billings, current liability if your billings are in excess of your cost. Okay. Now you come down and let's just take a look at how we're going to uh, estimate the profit. That's what they're going to be focusing on. And so we're going to flashcard these steps. Okay. This is a great flashcard. This flashcard goes all the way back. They had this same flashcard when I took the class. When I took Becker a long time ago, you know, they don't, not calling it a flashcard, but this same box was here as to how to calculate the gross profit or loss that should be recognized on a contract. And these steps answer all the questions. So I want you to flashcard this. I want you to memorize this. And then I want you to practice this when you get into your homework questions, right? Okay, so first of all, step one, get the contract profit, okay? And the profit is contract price minus the estimated total cost gives me my estimated gross profit on this. Now, to figure out what percent done I am, I take the total cost that have been incurred to date and I divide that by the total estimated cost of the contract, okay? Now that gives me the percent done I am. So if my what? Total cost to date or 700,000 and the total estimated cost of the contract is a million, I am 70% done and so on, okay? Step three, to figure out the gross profit that has been earned to date, I'm simply going to take the gross profit that I calculated in step one and multiply that by the percent done I, a, I think I am, which was calculated in step two. And that tells me the profit that I have earned to date. And then step four, to finish this out where the questions tend to ask you, you will want to figure out the current year's profit by taking what profit have I earned to date minus any profit I have already recognized at the beginning of the year. And that difference gives me my current year to date gross profit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, under what? Under both methods, completed contract and percentage of completion, you recognize the loss immediately. Rule conservatism says recognize the loss immediately. That's the case under completed contract. That's the case under percentage completion. Now, before I call out for questions, because I know sometimes you look at that and you're like, huh? Let's go through this example together right here. This is a really, really good, this example is a really good example. Um, however, I'm going to be marking this up so you can kind of see where the numbers from the fact pattern up here actually fed into the solution. And I'm going to mark it up. Don't mark it up with me. I know I typically ask you to mark these things up with me, but if you do, it's going to look like a spider on crack got onto your computer and I don't want that or onto your paper and I don't want that. So you should review this again later on your own, but I'm going to be marking it up as I go, but don't, don't follow my markings here. Okay. So we have a what? Sales price of 4 million. Okay. So when I'm going to do step one, I need to take the sales price minus what? The estimated total cost, right? So I think I'm going to have a profit of a million dollars on this, okay, thousand dollars, whatever. Now, the cost incurred to date on this thing are 1.5. And if I think I have what? Total estimated cost of three million, whatever, then I'm what? Cost incurred to date are 1.5. Total estimated cost are 3 million. So I am what? I am 
50% done, right? So now what do I do? Well, since I think I was going to have a profit of $1,000 on this thing, right? I bring that down. I bring down the percent done that I think I am. And I think I'm going to have 500,000 on this contract of profit. I'm adding the zeros here, guys. I don't know if they said amounts in thousands, but I'm gonna go ahead and add those thousands, okay? Since I haven't recognized profit in any previous year, then under the percentage of completion method, I say, hey, I earned all that profit this year because I haven't recognized anything in the previous year, okay? Now notice guys under completed contract method, completed contract method says, well, I'm not taking any profit till we're done. We ain't done, so I'm not taking any profit. Okay, all right, good. Then we go into year two and guys under this situation, the contract price doesn't change as we go along. Um, you know, federal defense contractors have a nice deal. They have a sweetheart deal with the federal government. They have what they call cost plus contract. So whatever the cost is, and then we're guaranteed a certain amount of profit. Nice work if you can get it, but most contracts don't work that way. Most contracts, what? They say, hey, here's the contract price. It's up to you to not overrun the cost of that contract, right? Okay, so what happens? Well, now we're thinking as we move along in year two, our engineering estimates are, well, you know, we're really going to incur a total cost of 3.2 million. So now we think our profit is only 800,000. We look and to date, we have what? We have the total estimated cost of the contract is 3,200, right? And we have spent 2,400 so far. So now we pull those two numbers down and we say, okay, we're actually 75% done. 75% done off of the what 800,000 we think is going to be the profit means that we really think our total profit on this contract is going to be six uh, that we've earned so far is 600,000, but we've already taken what? 500 in the previous year, haven't we? So this year we only take what? We only take 100 to bring us up to the 600 we think we've earned so far. Now you could go back and say, well, wait a minute, but our estimate wasn't correct in year one, da, da, da. change in accounting estimate. You do not restate for change in accounting estimate. You just go forward with that new estimate. Okay. And completed contract method saying, you see, this is why I didn't want to get into the percentage of completion because I don't know how great of engineering estimates we have. Okay. But, uh, you know, the company would choose based on those criteria that they think they can reasonably estimate the profit. Okay. Now, what happens? Year three, hey, contract price hasn't changed, but now we think we're going to spend 4.2 million on this. Do we like this contract anymore? We're thinking, okay, this was not the best deal for us, okay? Now we go ahead and we think we have a $200,000 loss on this contract because our costs are gonna exceed our sales. And this doesn't matter. I don't do this. I need to recognize all the loss. It doesn't matter how far along I am at this point. I am going to have to take the entire loss. So I have to do what? I have to take a loss 200,000, but, but since I have already taken profit of what? Six, 500 in year one, 100 in year two, I actually have to do what? I actually have to take a loss of 800,000, which reverses out the what? 600 that I took previously. So now net net impact on retained earnings is what? Is the 200,000 loss, right? Because I took what? I took income of 600,000 for the first two years, 500 the first year, 100,000 the second year. Now I realize, hey, I'm going to have a total loss on this contract of 200. So I have to take a loss of 800, which reverses out the what? The income from the first two years and brings me up to uh, the 200,000 net loss impact in retained earnings now. Question. Okay, then I finally do, uh, I finally limp into the last year of this contract and, you know, contract price hasn't changed. Now my estimated costs are 300,000, uh, 4,300,000. 
So I have to take that entire loss of 300,000. I've already taken what? I've already taken a net when you net those all together. I've taken a net of two. So I take a hundred this year and I always forget so irritating. I, mean, I don't know how long I've been teaching this. And I always forget to show you on completed contract what we took the 200,000 loss immediately. We hadn't taken any profit previously, but as soon as we realize we're going to have a loss on this, we take that immediately under completed contract. And then finally, we take that last portion of the loss under completed contract. And you do that in the year you discover you have the loss. Question. Okay, now under completed contract method, okay, uh, we are not going to take any profit on this contract until we are completely done. The balance sheet presentation, guys, you can write in there is same as percentage of completion. Okay. Um, when you account under the completed contract method, you are simply going to take the um, contract price minus the total cost, okay? And that isn't recognized until the contract is complete, or if it's a loss, you should do what? As we saw in the little example there, take it immediately, okay? Okay, good. So with all that, and I don't think we need to bother ourselves with all these journal entries, but we do want to practice with multiple choice questions here, um, because this is probably how the examiner is going to ask you. They'll probably give you three or four multiple choice questions. It'll be something like these. So let's go ahead and practice with those concepts right here. We'll do the first one first. Let me relaunch the poll.
Guys, you're at the three minute mark. Um, I'm gonna give you a little more time with this because it's a little bit uh, multi-layered to get to the solution. But I just want you to be aware of what three minutes feels like. This would probably be a three minute question on the exam that uh, you would be wrapping it up right about now. But keep going. I'm gonna give you a little extra time on this. Ten seconds, guys. Okay, looks like most of us have attempted this, and um, the largest percentage. Uh, shown here got it correct, but uh, less than half the class got the right answer. The answer here is D. So let's go ahead and let's go through this. And I can kind of understand. Um, I can kind of understand A and D. I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding B or C, why those were picked. Um, so if someone wants to chime in at some point with why they picked those, that's fine. But uh, I kind of get A and D because to get D, you had to find the choice that is A. So let's just look at this one. And you'll see what I'm talking about. So um, we have this construction company they use a percentage of completion method on January 1st, year one, half begin work on a $3 million construction contract. At the inception date, the estimated cost of the contract was $2,250,000. The following data relate to the progress of the contract. And they tell us that, hey, they took some income in year one and they incurred costs through year two of 1.8 and the estimated cost to complete the contract or 600,000 and they want the year two amount of gross profit now job one is to figure out well what is the total estimated cost of this contract in order to do that step one well if they've already done what they've spent 1,800,000 on this and they believe that what that the estimated cost to complete this thing are what six hundred thousand. Then to date, they have incurred cost of what two million. Yeah, two million four hundred thousand. Good. Okay. Now, if the price of the contract, if, you know, the contract price is three million. Okay, and so far they think that the costs are what going to be a total of two million four hundred thousand. That means they have a total estimated profit on this thing of what six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand, good. But how much of that can I take at this point in time? Well, that's going to be predicated on how much done I think I am, and to date they've incurred cost of what. 75 percent 1 million eight hundred thousand right divided by what the two million four hundred thousand which is the total estimated cost of the contract and somebody said so i don't know who it was because i'm looking down here is 75 percent right so six hundred thousand times 0.75 means that to date i think i have earned four hundred and fifty thousand on this but and that's why some of you maybe picked A, but that's not the right answer because it wants to know what have I earned what in year two. So I have to subtract what I had already recognized from year one. And so what I'm going to take for year two is simply the 150,000, thus choice D. So I see why it'd be a fairly um, easy mistake as you're kind of working out your understanding of this. A, 
obviously D is the right answer. I'm not sure if somebody wants to tell me how they got B or C, because I typically don't sit there and try to figure out what the wrong answers we're trying to do to you. Okay, all right, good. Let's take a look at question three then, and then we'll, uh, we'll take our break. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And um, hmm, I don't know what's going on with the percentages today, guys. I'm not, I'm, I'm thinking questions that we should be getting almost all correct, 100% um, correct. We're down below 75, which is not, uh, so I'm hoping we're paying attention and putting our best effort forward here, okay? So the answer here is D, 62% uh, of us got it right, but I would think 100% of us should have got this one right, and at least 75%. But during year one, title company began construction on a project scheduled for completion in year three. In December 31st, year one, an overall loss was anticipated at contract completion. What would be the effect of the project on year one operating income under US gap percentage of completion completed contracts. Let me ask you a question. If you have a loss on the contract, you take it all under both methods? Yes. 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 Loss yes. decrease net income? Yes. Do losses decrease net income? Yes. 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 This is why I'm thinking, why wouldn't it be 100% unless I'm missing something? Why everybody wouldn't have got that right? I mean, it's that simple. And the question, probably I gave you two minutes. This question probably should take you 20 seconds to answer. Okay. Okay, good. All right, guys. So maybe you're a little bit tired or something. Um, you know, maybe you can grab some water, grab some coffee during the break, turn the warrior game off. Okay, if that's the issue as to why you're not paying attention to get some of these low hanging fruit questions correct. And we're going to pick up uh, module five. I probably shouldn't have mentioned the basketball game now. I'm probably going to lose, we'll have more people not getting them right. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. Somebody please do me a favor and remind me to start that up again. Okay, so we don't lose the last half of the class. Okay, so we should be recording again. And um, we're going to pick up the discussion here with module O. Uh, before we do that, um, I wanted to do this before. Let me pause the recording again.
Thank you. Yeah, I'd start when I called the roll. Thank you. So now for uh, year two now, notice they had told us that they continued to lose 200,000 a month in year two. And so they're gonna have a loss from operation of the discontinued segment of 1.2 million. We report that net of tax, right? Okay, and then they finally got rid of this division and they got rid of it for 2 million. Now, remember, it was being carried at what? It was being carried at 2.2. They finally sold it for 2 million. And so they have what? They have this $200,000 loss from the operation, we report that net of tax, that's 120. Now, again, they could report this entire amount, 720 plus 120. It could have been reported as one amount. What does that come to? 840. You could have shown one amount. At what? That'd be 840. Am I doing my math right? Okay. But the um, loss on disposal must be disclosed. So even if you didn't report it on the face of the income statement, the way they showed you there, you would have to report it um, somewhere in the footnotes or something like that. Or you could do it right on the face the way they did. Question. Okay, good. If there's no question. Let's go ahead. And this is a really, I really think this is a great question to practice with this stuff. So let's take a look at this one.
Um, are we able to change our poll answer? I accidentally clicked the wrong one. No, I won't kill you. Okay, <laughs> good to know. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, you can't change it, but um, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll because we're over three minutes now, guys. And so, you, you know, you should have been wrapping that one up. And um, so I'm assuming, um, Michael, that you're the one person that picked D. Um, <laughs> yeah, I meant to click C. Okay, well, that means we got 100% on this one, which is great. Okay. And uh, what happens is um, when you look at a question like this, guys, it's really all about the setup. So you should be, and I noticed a few folks didn't even try this one. I don't know what's going on with that. I don't like that. I need you to work. You know, if you go to the gym and, you know, the coach says, or the weight trainer or whatever says, hey, you know, lift this three times. You don't just sit there and not lift it, do you? You go when you do what they're telling you to do, you know, so you get the results you want. Okay, so you need to practice along with this. And so you should be doing this here in class. And then certainly when you're working your homework and then on the exam, it's really all about the setup. Okay, we have a mnemonic lid that tells you the elements that would go into the discontinued operations and then we have what and then we have the flashcard that tells us that we take the amounts in the year in which they occur and we take them what net of tax and remember i said you could get all the answers correct just from that first paragraph okay and so what happens that we looked at here so they agreed to sell an asset of their heart division the decision represents a major strategic shift and will have a significant effect on the operations. The sale was completed on January 15th, year four, and resulted in a gain on disposal of 900,000. Hart's operating losses were 600,000 for year three and 50,000 for the period January 1st through uh, January 15th, year four disregarding income taxes. Okay, once I see that, I know, and I was trying to strike that out, I was trying to underline it, but if it's disregarding income taxes, I don't have to worry about the net of tax part of it. So now I just take these amounts that constitute lid and I take them in the period in which they occur. And so the problem tells me that they had what? Losses of 600,000 in year three, they don't get into impairment on this. They don't have to, okay? So there was nothing to put down for year three there. So I have what? I have 600,000 loss that would be reported in year three. And this is sort of a generous CPA exam question because I really only have to figure out one year to get the correct answer. But let's just keep going with this. They tell me that what? they lose 900,000, I should excuse me, they gain 900,000 on the disposal. That's the D in lid. And then they tell me that they had the loss from the operation of 50,000. That nets out to what? To the 850,000, which was obviously we knew already. C was the correct answer. Okay. Okay, so remember guys, they give you a, do they give scratch paper or scratch board now? I'm never sure, they kind of move all over the place. They gave scratch paper now. Paper, yeah. they give you two eight and a half by 11 sheets so that you got four sides to work with? Um, yes. Yeah, so they give you four papers. So you should be writing this once you fill up both sides of the two eight and a half elevens, four sides, right? The two sides. Once you fill it up, you have to raise your hand and say, please, may I have some more? And they'll bring you more paper. So don't try to be a, you know, environmentalist on the day of the exam, okay? Just waste paper like no other. Uh, just be cognizant that you're going to have to maybe wait a couple of seconds until well, they bring you in more paper if you run out. Professor, quick question. So yeah. that 50,000 should be in the loss instead of an impairment? Yes. Okay, just yes. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sometimes I walk, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah, 50,000, thank you. Okay, 
Okay, good. All right, let's look over at accounting changes. Okay, now they talk about accounting changes and we're going to see that there are really three types of accounting changes that are talked about here. Um, we're going to about, talk about change in estimate, change in principle, and change in accounting entity. Then we'll talk separately about the, con or is a sort of a separate conversation about error correction. Okay, now what happens? When we talk about change in estimate, we talk about prospective application, guys. So for change in estimate, we use prospective application, which means there is no restatement. There is no restatement. What happens? Financial statements are full of estimates. And if every time you had a change in an estimate going from year one to year two, from year, year two to year three, they told you you had to restate, you'd have to restate every year. And that sound you hear is used as a financial statement saying, make up your freaking mind, right? So what happens? They tell us, hey, that's too cumbersome. That's not going to benefit users if we have to restate every year. So we handle it prospectively. There is no restatement, okay? Classic example is change in the life of a fixed asset. And this is a nice example, very easy to understand. We've got this Carlin company buys a truck for 90,000. The truck is expected to last 10 years. And during the third year, they realize the truck is only gonna last a total of five years. The truck is depreciated on a straight line basis and they don't bother us with salvage value. So what happens? Since we were sitting here and we were depreciating it over a 10 year life, we took what? We took 9,000 the first year and 9,000 the second year. Now, when you look at that off of a value of what? 90,000, we've taken 18,000. So that means that now we have what? We have this 72,000 that is left at the end of year two, okay? And then during, sometime during year three, they decide that the thing only has a five-year life. Well, if it's five years and we have taken what? Two years, that means we have three years left. So we take that, what? That 72,000 and we divide it by the three years that are left it's year three year four year five we take the uh, 24,000 we don't go back to year one and say okay let's start all over again and restate this no we just go forward with that new estimate change in accounting estimate now it's important here that you see this during year three they don't tell us when they don't say whether it was you know january 1st june uh, july 1st December 31st, they don't tell us because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. At any time during year three, beginning, middle, end, you decide that this asset only has a three-year life, you use that to calculate the depreciation expense for the entire year. Okay? Okay, good. Now, when we look at change in estimate, they tell us that we handle it prospectively. Okay, you can, I guess, flashcard that here. It means that there is what? No restatement. Okay, so we've said that a couple of times now. If you want to want a flashcard in the heading, you can flashcard it right here in the outline. Okay, now, if a change affects future periods, okay, the effect on income from continuing operations, net income, and related per share information for the current year should be disclosed in the notes to the financial statement. So you should continue to report the effect that this change has on the accounting estimate for these elements, and you should report that in the notes to the financial statement. You don't have to restate, but they do want you to put in the notes information that would sort of allow them to make a comparison for this change until that information has worked its way through the financial statements. In other words, you know, at the end of year five, you could drop off those disclosures because they're no longer affecting the financial statements. Okay. Okay, good. Now, change in accounting principle. And they use a very irritating, nerdy term here 
called retrospective application. Retrospective application is FASB speak or restatement. Or restatement, restatement. But don't call it. Restatement. Okay, now this gets a little confusing, guys. What happens? In the accounting world, restatement is a nasty word. Restatement is a bad word. That means that something really bad happened, a mistake or something like that. And now we have to restate. And so FASB doesn't want to call the approach restatement, but it's equivalent to what you would do if you had a restatement. But we call it retrospective application. So it doesn't sound as nasty as what? As restatement. So the process that I'm going to describe to you here under cumulative effect of change in accounting principle is the same thing you would do for a restatement, but don't call it that. Ooh, no, no, call it what? Call it retrospective application, okay? So a change in accounting principle is a change from one accounting principle that is accepted to another principle that is accepted. So it's not a mistake. It's just you decided that you would you know, have a better presentation if you use the new method. They call that the rule of preferability. Okay. Now, when you take a look at how we're going to do this, and we're going to calculate something called a cumulative effect, and they tell us that if non-comparative financial statements are being presented, then the cumulative effect of change in accounting principles equal to the difference between the amount of beginning rate chain earnings in the period of change and what retained earnings would have been if the accounting principle had been retroactively applied to all periods affected, okay? So what does that mean? We go back, and if it goes back 10 years, it goes back 10 years. We go back and we see what would have our retained earnings been if we had used the new method in years one through 10. So we decide in year 11, we're gonna change. What would have our retained earnings been at the beginning of year 11, the end of year 10, if we had used the new method in all those previous years, okay? And then we'll make a cumulative effect adjustment to the beginning retained earnings of year 11, and we'll report that net of tax, okay? Now that's for cumulative statements, okay? I mean, excuse me, non-comparative statements. If comparative statements, are being presented, then the cumulative effect is difference is equal to the difference between the beginning retained earnings of the, they say the first period presented, and I don't like that. They really should say the earliest. I'm going to squeeze in the word earliest period presented, and what retained earnings, ah, and what the retained earnings would have been had the new principle been applied to all prior periods, that's periods before that earliest period, okay? And as I've already said, the cumulative effect is going to be reported as adjustment to beginning retained earnings, net of tax, and we will make that adjustment in our statement of stockholders equity, the retained earnings section, okay? Now, come over and let's take a look, not at this example, which I don't like. Let's take a look at my example, which I do like. Okay, so let's just take a look at this. And guys, uh, this is posted on um, e-learning and, um, I mean, not e-learning, yeah. Is that what they call it, e-learning, yeah. And, um, you know, if you have your class gallery really big, what I suggest you do is squeeze over the participants as much as possible, make it a really, really small or, and then expand the screen so you can see this thing better. You know what I'm talking about? There's a little bar you can toggle over and it'll make all your classmates get really, really tiny on the screen. And that's okay for right now. You can bring them back later if you want to, and that'll allow you to see this a little bit better, okay? 
All right, good. So I'm going to go through this cumulative effect example. And in this example, let's see if they'll let me draw so I can, since we're used to highlighting when we go through, okay. And they tell me that company X began business in 2018 using the completed contract method. In 2020, the company changes to percentage of completion. No income tax was recognized in 2018 nor 2019 since no contracts were completed. Net income would have been 100,000 in 2018 and 200,000 in 2019 had the percentage of completion method been used in those years. Net income is 400,000 in 2020 using the percentage of completion method and 50,000, it would have been 50,000 had the company continued to use the completed contract method prepare the 2020 statement of retained earnings, a section of the statement of stockholders equity. Now, notice here, guys, I give you what? I give you non-comparative statements and I give you what? I give you comparative statements. So let's do the non-comparative statements first, okay? And so what happens when we look at the comparative statements, excuse me, non-comparative statements, Retained earnings was reported at what? At a beginning balance, the same retained earnings had a beginning balance of zero. And the cumulative effect of the change in accounting principle is 300,000. That's what? That's the 100,000 more of income we would have had in 2018 and the 200,000 more of income we would have had in 2019. And guys, I'm ignoring income taxes here. All this would have been net of tax, right? But I'm just ignoring income taxes. And so the cumulative effect is what? 100,000 from 2018, 200,000 from 2019 is 300,000. I have the restated beginning balance of 300,000. My net income for the percentage of completion using percentage of completion in 2020 is 400,000. Ending balance is 700,000. Note right off the bat here, guys, the difference, and the exam will do this to you. They'll tell you what the difference would have been between the two methods. In this example, completed contract and percentage of completion had com uh, completed contract continue to be used in the period of change. That is not part of the cumulative effect adjustment. You simply do what? You simply use the new method in the period of change. And the cumulative effect does not include the difference between the old and new method in the period of change. Human effect is calculated on all periods prior to the change. Question. Okay, when we are talking about comparative statements, the only change up now is that we have to do what? We have to make the human effect calculation only on the earliest period presented. So now we have what? 2019 is the earliest period presented. The beginning balance of the 2019 retained earnings was zero because we hadn't taken any income in 2018. Then what? Then we would have looked at what our income would have been in 2018 had we used the percentage of completion. And it was what? It would have been 100,000. That's the cumulative effect. Okay. And then we have what? Then we have the, um, uh, da, 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 what do we? Cumulative effect is 100,000. We have the restated is 100,000. And had we used what? Had we used the percentage of completion in 2019, our net income would have been what? Net income would have been 200,000. So there it is. That's our net income for that year. The ending balance, therefore, in the retained earnings is 300,000. We have that then as the beginning balance in 2020. And we simply take the net income using the percentage of completion method for um, 2020, notice that the retained earnings ends up in the same place either way, okay? And since we are presenting 2019's comparative statements using percentage of completion, we would, we don't call it restate, but we would simply restate the 2019 statements using percentage of completion. And that's how that net income just rolls over from the income statement for 2019 to um, the um, 
to the statement of retained earnings for 2019. Question. And you can see this series of questions that I could see the examiners asking some stuff like that off of a fact pattern like this. Question. Okay, if there's no question on that, you can. Oh, yes, <clears throat> so I have a question. So yeah. uh, this example is just a uh, comparison, the non-compatible and compatible statement. Is that the? the well, it shows the application of the rules that we've been talking about this retrospective application. And it shows them in the um, context of a comparative statement versus non-comparative. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, but this is the application of the rules that we just, um, you know, kind of had read through there. I kind of read you through those, right? Uh, how to do it if it's comparative versus non comparative. And then I gave you the example instead of this example, which I don't think does a very good job in bringing that all together. So, so this is additional example for illustration number one. I, you know, you can read the illustration number one if you want. I ain't reading it because I don't like it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. Any other question? Okay, now a couple of um, exceptions um, to the rule. Okay, uh, well, let's look at reporting change in accounting principle right here. Okay, so the general rule, which we just went through what the hell's going on here it's not letting me all right okay so it's going to be like that huh so we're going to have one of those interesting situations now come back to full screen put it on yellow Okay, it's going to make me, I believe, make me close the PDF annotator. Maybe it'll just make me close this one. So I can leave it open for this. Okay, let's try this. Okay, good. Okay, reporting change in account and principle. Okay, so let's just take a look now. The general rule, okay, the general rule is that change in account and principle should be recognizing by adjusting beginning retained earnings of the earliest period presented for the cumulative effect change. And prior period comparative statements are presented, they should be what? If they're presented, they should be what? Restated. And that whole thing, and that's where it gets confusing because we're restating it, but we're calling it what? Retrospective uh, application. Okay. Okay. So that was what we just looked at. So let's look at a couple of uh, estim, um, exceptions to the general rule, and if it is impractical to estimate, okay, impractical to estimate, and they say if it is considered impractical to accurately estimate the cumulative effect adjustment, then the change is handled prospectively. We don't have to do a restatement, okay? An example of change of any periods presented. An example of change handled in this manner is change in inventory cost flow assumption to LIFO to any other method, since the cumulative effect adjustment to LIFO would require reestablishment recalculation of old inventory layers. Go ahead and flashcard that, including the specific example of LIFO, because I think the standard setters called that out as an example of this impractical to estimate, but think about it. Let's say you're Macy's and you've been in business for, you know, the hundred and whatever years they always boast about. And let's say you were using FIFO and you changed to LIFO. 
Well, now you'd have to go back through 150 years of information and say, you know, all those inventory items, the men's hats and stuff that we told you that we had sold under FIFO. Well, guess what? They're still in ending inventory. That would be what? That would be very difficult to estimate. And so the standard setters say, ah, eh, that's okay. Just sit there and handle it as a change in accounting estimate. And of course, what? And of course, disclose. Disclose that you've had this change. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and depreciation method. Okay. And so what happens? Let's say a company changes from straight line from from a declining balance a double declining balance and they go to straight line well if you're using double declining balance depreciation what you're doing is you're saying well this de asset depreciates quickly in its early years and more slowly in its later years if you then switch to straight line now you're saying this asset depreciates evenly over its life so is this a change in method or a change in estimate well, CPAs used to get into barroom brawls over this, right? So FASB finally settled down and said, hey, settle down, you all. We're going to tell you that if you have a change in accounting uh, estimate that is inseparable from a change in accounting uh, principle, treat it as a change in estimate. Treat it as a change in estimate, okay? So a change in the method of depreciation could be considered both a change in principle and a change in estimate. Settle down, you all. Just handle it as a change in estimate. No need to start throwing chairs at each other. Okay, they just told us what to do. Okay, okay, good. Now, once again, a summary. We've said this now a couple of times. Application of the general rule. The amount of cumulative effect to be reported on the retained earnings statement is the difference between retained earnings at the beginning of the earliest presented and what retained earnings would have been reported at the beginning of the earliest, presented, earliest period presented if the new accounting principle had been retrospectively applied to all prior periods by recognizing only the direct effects, blah, blah. Okay, the new accounting principle is used for all periods presented. Prior periods are restated, and that's why it gets confusing because we call it retrospective application. Meanwhile, we're actually restating, right? Okay, all right, good. Now, change in accounting entity is also retrospective application, but again, it comes out to a restatement. Okay. So let me start out here with a story, right? I had a student, Becker student, some years back, calls me up, you know, 9, 9.30 at night. Hello? Hi, John, this is your former student. I have a question. I'm sitting here at work and I have a client that in a, did you pass the CPA exam? Oh, yes, I did. I have a client here that in a previous period, had um, not consolidated their uh, companies under the single ownership. In this year, they want to show consolidated statements. And I have finished the consolidation for this year, but I can't remember, they're preparing comparative statements and I can't remember what I'm supposed to do for the previous year. And I'm like, well, you have to consolidate those too. So that they're comparative. You have to restate by consolidating year one. All I heard was silence on the other end. And I'm thinking the reason all I heard silence on the other end is the person was holding back tears because at 9.30 at night, they probably just bludgeoned their way through the consolidation for the second year. And now they're going to have to go and do what? Do the same thing for year one, which could be a pretty tough task. And they're probably up against some sort of deadline. Okay. So the rule, they call it retrospective application, but the rule is what? Any prior period presented have to be restated to show what it would have looked like had you consolidated in a previous year. That's what we call change in accounting entity. Okay. Example include, and really this is what they're talking about, consolidated or combined statements that are presented in place of statements of individual company. Okay. Now they tell us restate to reflect 
the information for the new entity if comparative statements are presented, even though they call it what? Retrospective application. And if a change in accounting entity occurs, the current year and all private prior period statements presented in a comparative format along with the current year should be restated to reflect the information for the new reporting entity. Now, if there are periods affected that what aren't presented or if it's non-comparative statements, then you'll do what? Then you'll make an adjustment to the beginning retain earnings of the earliest period presented. And of course you consolidate uh, the current year statement. So the rule is very similar to what we talked about with cumulative effect, but uh, you should know the change in accounting entity is called retrospective application, even though we would restate any prior periods presented to show what it would have looked like had we consolidated in those prior periods. So flashcard that. Okay. Now, error correction and prior period adjustment. If it's an error, now we use the R word. Now we, of course, they both had R's in them. Okay. But now we do what? Now we restate. We're going to do the same thing we would be doing for the cumulative effect for error correction, but now we come out and call it a restatement. So you'll probably see in your task based simulation homework for F1 a problem where they're going to ask you and they're going to say how to handle the different things. And if it's what? If it's change in accounting estimate, it is handled prospectively. If it's cumulative effect, it is, uh, if it's change in accounting principle, uh, it's going to be what? It's going to be retrospective. If it's change in accounting entity, it's going to be retrospective. But if it's a change in, if it's an error correction, it's called a restatement. Meanwhile, for the last three, the process is exactly the same. Can they be any more annoying than this, FASB? Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead and let's just take a look at error, correction of errors, okay, and a correction of error. Um, if and can I just come over a uh, correction of errors are errors okay um, statements resulting from mathematical mistakes okay misuse of facts change from non gap method to a gap method okay all of these are uh, corrections of errors. Okay, now you come over and let's see what we're supposed to do and correct the information if the year is presented. In other words, restate if comparative statements are presented and the financial statements for the year with the error are presented, merely, merely, haha, merely correct the error and go, you know, have a drink somewhere. I mean, you know, this is a restatement. Okay, so correct the error in those prior period statements. Restate those prior period statements to make the correction, right? Adjust beginning retain earnings of the earliest year presented if the year is not presented. Well, that's the same thing we do for the cumulative effect, isn't it? But now we're calling it restatement, okay? And um, right here, if non-comparative statements, then what? Then you're going to have to adjust it to the beginning balance of the retained earnings of the only period presented. Same thing we said for cumulative effect. Okay, we don't need to go through that example. That gets a little too much, not worth our time here. And yeah. Okay, here's what we're gonna do, guys. We're gonna look at um, these two questions and then we're gonna call it an evening because I can't do a proper job in the time we have left for a statement of comprehensive income and I don't wanna rush through it, okay? So let's do these last couple of questions and then we're gonna get out a little bit early and we'll pick up with module seven next time, okay? All right, good. So let's just go ahead and let's jump into this because I don't wanna rush through um, comprehensive income because I know that when they cover that they kind of da -da 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 -da, real quick in intermediate accounting and then all of a sudden you're 
looking at it here and we probably got a little bit of work to do to make sure we're clear and reviewing that properly okay so let's just go ahead and let's do these couple multiple choice questions relaunch the poll Okay, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll on this one. We're about up on the uh, two minute mark here. And um, good, looks like just about everyone got this um, correct, but um, let's go ahead and um, take a look at this one. The answer is D, almost everybody got it. But um, let's take a look. And per US GAAP, which of the following, and again, guys, they leave some of these US GAAP call outs here. IFRS is not tested on the exam. Which of the following statements is correct regarding changes that result in the financial statements that are in effect the statement of a different reporting entity? The statement of a different reporting entity is what? That phrase right there is telling you we have a change in accounting entity. We have a change in accounting entity. What? The financial statements of all periods presented should be restated. Now, what have, might have messed you up um, is this notion, or almost everybody got it right, but this notion that we don't use the word restate to describe this process, we call it what? Retroactive application, right? Okay. There is no cumulative effect adjustment reported on an income statement. That's reported what? On the statement, directly on the statement of retained earnings, and that would happen for what? for uh, the change in reporting entity affecting any periods not being presented. But the correct answer is what? The financial statements for all prior periods presented should be restated. That process is called retrospective application, which is annoying. Okay. Okay, good. Let's look at one more and then we're gonna get out of here.
Okay, guys, we're just about at the two minute mark. So uh, let's go ahead and I'm gonna end the poll and take a look at this one. And uh, looks like most of us got it right. Um, a 73% of us anyway. Um, few of us wanted B. And so we take a look at this one. The answer is A here. But for year one company estimated two year equipment warranty cost based on $100 per unit sold in year one. Experience during year two indicated the estimate should have been based on $110 per unit. The effect of this $10 difference from the estimate, we have what? Change in accounting estimate. And so what? There is not going to be any restatement for change in accounting estimate. Nobody picked that, right? Okay. And then B, an accounting change net of tax below year two income from continuing operations. I know some of you picked that. And I don't know what to tell you. That sounds like someone speaking about accounting after a couple of shots at Patron. I don't know what to tell you. There is no such thing as an accounting change net of tax below year two income from continuing operation. I know if I have a discontinued operation, I might do that. But they were nowhere near describing a, a discontinued operation to me here. So it is what? It is simply a change in accounting estimate. We'll use the new estimate in the going forward, year two and further years in which that estimate still seems appropriate. Choice A. So I think we, you know, from the discussion saw that B and C were absolutely wrong. Nobody picked that. And B, I mean, sometimes they just put enough shit in an answer that makes you think it's right <laughs> for that answer. So that's all I can tell you. There's just way too much crap in that answer. I don't even know what to tell you about it. So it's just way off. There's no such animal as this. Okay. Question. Okay, guys. Um, that is it for tonight because I can't cover statement comprehensive income in the eight minutes we have left. We'll pick up with module seven next time and we will get into chapter two. Make sure you're doing your homework because I am going to become looking. Okay. Okay, guys. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good rest Thank of the week. You. Thank you. Thank you.